is still not. Okay, mic is on. <laughs> Thank you, Tejas. Um, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Satya, and uh, I work on React at Meta. I'm uh, super stoked to be back again at React India. Um, it's incredible to think about how much progress we made um, with the React compiler since then. And I can't wait to share all of the updates with you today. Um, quick show of hands. How many of you have heard of the React compiler? OK, wow, that's, that's quite a lot. That's amazing. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the React compiler, the React compiler um, automatically memoizes your code. So you don't have to use use memo, use callback, or react.memo. It um, ships as a Babel plugin, so you can just add it to your build pipeline. Uh, we open sourced the React compiler earlier this year, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. Well, what's, what's new since then? Well, we've been working hard to improve the React compiler since open sourcing it. We added support for more syntax and even optimized the generated code. There are too many compiler optimizations for me to like, go through right now. Um, so I picked a few uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of work we've been doing. One big focus area has been improving the generated code by doing more precise memoization. Uh, to make this concrete, let's examine a simple hook that fetches data, processes it, and then returns a list of videos. After running through the compiler, this component is now memoized. Know that I'm using use memo here just to keep the code simple, but the compiler output is slightly different. It's more lower level. Um, in this example, we, uh, the use memo dependency is on data, which looks correct to us, right? But actually, thinking more, uh, we don't really need to invalidate the memo if data changes. We only need to invalidate if the data.kind or the data.values change, because they're the only ones that are being used in that memo block, right? So in this example, our memoization is too coarse-grained. So we can do better by just depending on the exact fields in the memoization block. This might look pretty simple and straightforward for us, but this is really challenging due to the complexities of the JavaScript semantics. Um, for instance, if data was null, then in the compiled code, the if, um, if we access a field, then we would throw an exception. So the behavior would be different if it was memoized. Right? So the compiler has to uh, prove that data will never be null to apply this optimization. And to get this right, we had to like, rewrite a whole bunch of uh, compiler pipeline. OK, moving on. The compiler has a built-in type inference as well. Uh, the type inference helps us to improve memoization. This is different from uh, TypeScript types. So we don't actually use TypeScript types. Uh, we want to support everyone. Uh, so we also want to support people who don't use TypeScript. Uh, so we want the compiler to work with vanilla JavaScript as well. So let's, let's consider this simple hook. Like the previous example, it features some data, does some processing, and then returns the value. Pretty straightforward. Now, one way to memoize this would be like this where we combine the statements together, um, and the memoization block depends on data.edges. But as you can see, we can do better if we split the memo and memoize each statement separately. Right? So this is because now if um, only edges changes, then only then we need to rerun the filter. Uh, this is fine-grained memoization. So it's probably obvious to us what's going on in the filter function. But think about it from the compiler point of view. For all it knows, at first glance, filter could be doing all kinds of crazy things because it's JavaScript, right? We had to teach it to recognize that this is an array, and this filter function is a built-in array filter method. Now, looking at this statement in isolation, 
it's clear that the type of the empty array is array. But the compiler doesn't know what the type of data.edges is. So to teach the compiler about data.edges, we added the ability to add these type information to the compiler config. So you can add common um, functions and utilities to the config, and the compiler will learn from that. So once we add the type definitions, the compiler is now able to infer that this is an array. So now we know that edges must be of type array, since well, either values that are assigned to it are arrays. Um, know that we're still figuring out how to ship this uh, configuration in open source. Uh, keep an eye out on the working group for, to follow along the discussion on that. Cool, so that, that was a sneak peek on like some of the optimizations we've been working on. Uh, apart from the compiler, we also open sourced a new ESLint plugin, um, which is powered by the React compiler. So this is more powerful than the previous ESLint plugin that we had. This plugin helps you identify common errors directly in your IDE, um, so you can fix it immediately. We, we use this, uh, we've enabled this for all developers at Meta, and I highly recommend that you add it to your workflow. If there's one takeaway from this talk, it's this. Keep, like, go home today and add, it, add this to your IDE. We've, uh, we've been continuously improving this plugin, um, expanding the range of violations it can detect. Additionally, we've, uh, we've addressed and corrected some false positives that previously led to incorrect errors. So this is an example of uh, a rule violation in React. Uh, the ESLint plugin can catch this. So you're not allowed to read and write to a ref in render. This should only be done in effects or event handlers. But this is like a common bug that we've seen in practice and we've codified into our ESLint plugin. But there's a catch here. That is an exception to this rule. When you're lazily initializing a ref, it's OK to do this. Uh, both the compiler and the ESLint plugin have been updated to understand this pattern. So if you use this in your code base, the compiler will not flag it as an error. OK, cool. So those were the improvements to the compiler and the plugin. Uh, but we also care about the community at Meta. Simply shipping the compiler and seeing improvements at Meta isn't our only goal. We want to bring the community along with us and help you adopt the compiler. As uh, part of our experimental release, we also announced the invite-only React Compiler Working Group to provide feedback, ask questions, and collaborate on the compiler's experimental release. We received tons of feedback, and it's helped us a lot with the open source rollout. Uh, we've also been listening to everyone on X. It's, it's been great to see such positive feedback about the compiler. We've um, also been listening to constructive feedback on the compiler, and we've been working on addressing it po whenever possible. I want to give a special shout out to Nadia for writing this blog post. Um, if you all haven't read it, I recommend you read it. It's, it's a great blog post. Um, this blog post discusses a pattern that the compiler didn't know, uh, and it didn't generate optimal code. So I'll walk you through an example similar to the one in the blog. And we'll uh, walk through how to fix that issue. OK, so let's uh, take a look at this app. It's, it's a pretty simple app. We've got some state um, to store the list of people. We've got a form component um, for adding new people and a list component to display the array of people. And here's the list component. In, in this component, we map over the list of people to generate the JSX and then render it. It's pretty straightforward. We've all written code like this. And um, now let's try to memoize this component. Right? We wrap the map call in a use memo so that we don't re-render the list unnecessarily. Looks good, right? Like This is what I would write. Um, this is what the compiler does too. But there's a catch. What happens if we add an entry to the array. Well, we end up with a new array that has all the existing items plus the new item. 
This means we'd end up re-rendering all the items again, not just the new one. Right? This isn't ideal. What we'd ideally want to do is to memoize within the callback as well, so there's more fine-grained memoization. But actually, this isn't possible, because this violates the rules of hooks. OK, mm, let's go back to our original code and see if there's any other way to do this. Um, well, we could move the nested JSX into a separate component and then memoize the individual elements in that component. Then we don't violate the rules of hooks. So we do that here. The nested JSX expression is now moved to a new component called item. And we've updated the old component to render this item instead. And now the compiler can memoize the newly created component, just like it does with any other component, right? But this is a bit tedious. Like, imagine having to look through your entire code base, um, checking every single JSX expression, thinking uh, through whether it needs refactoring or not, and then actually refactoring it out to a new component, updating the original component to use this new component. It is a lot of manual work to get the performance we want. Right? There was nothing incorrect about the old code. The UI was, is still the same in both. Right? This change is just for performance reasons. And we don't want developers to think about um, optimizing their code. We want developers to think about building UIs. That's why we picked React. Right? We, we like to build UIs, and we want to think about that. We want to solve problems for our users, not think about how to make our apps fast. So we've actually added all of these optimizations to the compiler to do it automatically. So the compiler will automatically figure out what are the right JSX expressions that need to be optimized and will refactor your code to make it faster. So this process of moving code from one function to another function is called outlining in compiler theory. But keep in mind, this feature isn't enabled by default yet. So if you go try it today, it may, not work. it may not show up unless you turn on a flag. It's behind a flag right now. And we want to run an experiment to see what the performance impact of this change is first. So you can, uh, in essence, you can continue to write and structure the code as it makes sense for you and for your app. The compiler will take advantage of the guarantees provided by the React programming model and optimize the code automatically. To me, this is the power of the programming model of React. And we deeply believe in this. The main reason I wanted to explore this specific optimization is to showcase the capabilities of the React compiler. This optimization isn't about memoization. right? It's about creating a new component and moving code between components, which is a general purpose compiler optimization. And to me, this really shows the power of the React compiler. And this optimization is a concrete example of how our vision for the React compiler is far beyond just auto-memoization. So we think of the React compiler as a platform to build more transformations and optimizations. So you can keep writing React code as you know it, the compiler will come along and optimize your code automatically. So you can expect us to ship more optimizations in the future. Auto-memoization is just the first step. And another example of this uh, platform mission that I talked about coming to fruition is the recent work on inlining JSX element creation. Um, instead of using the current JSX Babel plugin to transform uh, JSX, the compiler can actually do this transformation. Uh, the compiler automatically converts JSX into the output of the JSX runtime call. This is still experimental, too. We're going to run a um, local experiment at Meta, see the performance impact, and then ship it. OK, so we've uh, discussed the upcoming improvements to the compiler. Now, how do I get, how do I use this? What are the next steps for open source? Well, 
Our initial release was focused on identifying major issues with using the compiler in big apps. And we've gotten great feedback. And we've improved the compiler substantially since then. And we're now ready for broad feedback from the community and for library authors to try out the compiler. And today, I'd like to announce the public beta release of the React compiler at React India. There's a new beta release on NPM that you can install right now. But listen to the talk, and then you can do that. <laughs> um, so with this release, you can now try out the React compiler on apps that are not yet on React 19. Uh, React compiler produces code that depends on runtime APIs that were added in React 19. But we've added support for the compiler to also work with older versions of React based on feedback we received um, during the experimental um, release. So for applications and libraries that target older versions of React, you can specify a version target and use a React compiler runtime package to polyfill all of the required APIs. The compiler uses its knowledge of JavaScript and the rules of React to automatically memoize values within your components and hooks. So if it detects any breakages of the rules, it will automatically skip over them and continue to compile the rest of your app. Has, has, have folks heard of this uh, link? Have, have you looked at this, uh, the rules of React? Quick show of hands. OK, it's quite a lot. But I recommend people to go look at this. This um, doc explains all of the rules in detail. And the ESLint plugin that I talked about earlier codifies all of this. So if you violate any of these rules in your app, the ESLint plugin will warn you. Um, so it, it will make sure that you're following the rules and your app is not buggy. OK, cool. So because of the expressivity of JavaScript, it's not possible for the compiler to always statically detect the violations. Um, so we recommend that you test your app thoroughly after installing the compiler. If you believe that you're following the rules, but you also see a bug, then, then please file an issue there um, so that we can fix it for everyone. The React compiler needs to run on original source code before any source transformations. So we use a lot of information from the source code to optimize your app. So if there are transformations that happen and we lose that information, then the memoization wouldn't be optimal. So we recommend, um, our recommendation is for library authors to independently compile and test their libraries and then ship the compiled code to NPM so that applications can just start using the compiled code. And we've published updated docs on the website for more information on how to use the new beta. And we've also added polyfills, uh, information on how to use the polyfills for the older versions of React. OK, so that's the beta. And um, after addressing any issues that might arise from the beta release, we intend to ship a new uh, release candidate when the majority of the apps and libraries that follow the rules have been proven to work well with the compiler. So, and then after a period of final feedback from the community, we will release a stable release of the compiler. We, we hope you try the beta release of the compiler and give us feedback. Thank you.